Hello and welcome to the New Testament Daily with me, Jerry Dierman, where we read and talk through a chapter of the New Testament every single day. I'm glad you're here because reading God's Word daily will change your life. You can also help others find out about this resource and stay in the Word daily when you click like on this video, subscribe to my YouTube channel, or share this link with others. So let's pray and then we'll jump into God's Word. Father, thank you so much for the precious, written, inspired, living Word of God. And I pray that by the Holy Spirit, each of us would hear exactly what you want to say to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, here we go. The epistle of Paul to the Romans, the letter of Paul, the apostle to the Romans, chapter one, here's what it says. Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David, according to the flesh and declared to be the son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Through him, we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. Let's, let's just go back through this and I'll do it rather quickly, but there's so much here that is interesting, but also important. Number one, Paul, as with his other letters and most of the other letters, but not all, he identifies himself as the author of this letter. Later on in verse seven, he identifies exactly who he's writing to. So Paul, a bond servant, a bond servant is not a typical slave. A bondservant is someone who chooses to remain a slave or a servant of the master. And he said, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, I choose to serve him. I choose to continue to do whatever he wants me to do. It is my joy and honor is what he's saying. And he says, a bondservant of Jesus Christ. And then watch this, called to be an apostle. Called. In other words, I didn't call myself. I've been called of God to be an apostle. The word apostle itself means sent one. But we also know that an apostle in the list outlined in, for example, Ephesians 4.11, when Jesus ascended on high, he led captivity captive and he gave gifts to men. Verse 11, he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. We often refer to those as the five office gifts. Paul said, I was called to be an apostle, a sent one, somebody who admittedly himself would say in places like 1 Corinthians 3, I go to places where the gospel was not established before anybody heard anything about this. I will go in and break the gospel open in that community, lay a foundation for a church and establish elders in that church and such before I'm sent to another place. And so this was a typical way that Paul was used. But he said, I was called to this. I was called to be an apostle. Watch this, separated to the gospel of God. There's a difference between being called to something and being separated to something. When David was the youngest of his brothers and Samuel came to the house to anoint one of the sons of Jesse as king, David ended up being anointed as king. But guess what? He wouldn't be king for quite a number of years because Saul was the king. And until Saul died, David was not appointed the king. So he was called, he was anointed to be the king, but he was not yet appointed to be the king. In the same way, the apostle Paul says here, I was called to be an apostle, but I've also been separated. We could say deployed in the 13th chapter of Acts. We see that certain prophets and teachers were fasting and praying. And in the middle of that session, Paul and Barnabas were among them. The Holy Spirit spoke likely through a prophetic word. Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Deploy them out on their first missions trip, so to speak, on their first assignment. And so um, they had been preaching before that, by the way. They had been doing ministry before that. But now there was a clear separation unto that apostolic calling. So he said, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised. Now he's talking about the gospel, the good news this whole plan of salvation. The gospel of God, verse 2, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. In other words, the gospel didn't show up in the New Testament. Paul, a Pharisee who was well-versed and studied in what we now call the Old Testament, but at that point, it was the Scriptures. He said the gospel was promised in all these Scriptures, the Old Testament Scriptures. Jesus is all through the Old Testament. The feasts. He was the Passover lamb. 
He is the coming king and Messiah. Passage after passage, it refers to, it gives analogy to, they are metaphors for the coming Messiah. And Paul said, man, it's all about Jesus. And it's in the Holy Scriptures concerning, verse 3, his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, watch this, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh. In other words, both Mary and Joseph were from the tribe of Judah and from the lineage of David, King David. He was born of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the son of God. See, we're contrasting the son of David and the Son of God, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. So this is interesting because even though God said about Jesus, like at the baptism of John the Baptist, when when Jesus was baptized by his cousin John, God said, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. So God was acknowledging him as the Son of God then. But something happened of him being born, or we might even say reborn, into, uh, as a son of God, a child of God, uh, the firstborn. Revelations calls Jesus the firstborn from the dead. The firstborn from the dead. Uh, Lazarus, among others, were raised from the dead, but then died again. Jesus was resurrected from the dead the firstborn from the dead. So Paul has given some revelation. I didn't see this for many years, that in Bethlehem he was born of a baby of the tribe of Judah, of the lineage of David. But when he was raised from the dead, (laughs) this was the second birth like we all have to have. We have to have the first birth as a baby and the second birth, the new birth, spiritual birth. And when Jesus was raised from the dead, the Bible says that he was raised According to the spirit of holiness, he was declared, verse 3, he was declared, excuse me, verse 4, to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. So he's the firstborn from the dead, Revelation 1 says. In other words, something happened where he was declared to be the son of God with power. He was born into humanness in Bethlehem of the seed of David. He was born into the Son of God with power when he was raised from the dead. He was of a humble nature as a typical human being, dependent on the power of the Holy Spirit to empower him in his life and ministry. But when he was resurrected from the dead, oh, let me tell you, he has assumed, or we could say reassumed, all the powers that he had before he became a human being. Along with others, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth, Matthew 18, 18, or 28, 18. And so something of a born, a birth, being the son of God with power happened at the resurrection. It's a mystery, but it is clear, not only in this text, but in other New Testament texts as well. Declared to be the son of God with power by the spirit of holiness or according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead. Two births, Bethlehem to David's seed, the resurrection as the son of God. Through him, we have received grace. Through him, through this resurrected son of God, we have received grace. This is an enablement, ability, something that comes from God and apostleship. So we have a calling. We have an assignment, a role that we play in the body of Christ, talking about him and his companions, Paul and his companions. We've received enablement and a calling for obedience to the faith. We can't just take this enablement and do anything we want to do with it. Oh, no. This is enablement to do this calling. Grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom You also, now he's talking to his recipients, his audience, among whom you also, and by the way, we're included in this, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. Let's just say it. Every one of you, every one of us are called of God to an assignment, and we have been given grace and apostleship. We'll talk about that again when we get to the 12th chapter of Romans, where he outlines that everybody in the body of Christ has received grace. Okay. So among whom you are the called of Jesus Christ. Now, verse seven, that's who is writing and the context. He said, now, let me tell you who I'm writing to, 
to all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. All of you who are beloved, called to be saints in the city of Rome. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe these greetings in these epistles or these letters are not just formalities, but I believe they are declaring the grace of God. These authors are declaring the peace of God. So when we read them, we should receive grace. Every time we read this, Lord, we receive grace right now. Lord, we receive peace right now from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 8. First, so this is kind of where he gets into uh, what he wants to say. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. There's something about the faith of these Roman believers that testimony is uh, traveling around the world about. Verse 9, For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing, I don't stop, without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. I love that Paul affirms two things. Number one, that he just continues to pray. He's a constant prayer. But second, that he doesn't always intercede for any one person or church for lengthy periods of time. Sometimes he's just making mention of them. But this also tells us that while we're praying, and we may be praying for Bob, Lord, help Bob protect him. Lord, deliver him from this trial that he's going through and such. And then comes to mind, John's going through something similar. And we just say, Lord, do the same thing for John. What are we doing? We're making mention. But Paul is modeling for us and letting us know that counts. When you said, Lord, do the same thing for John. You don't have to necessarily rehearse all the same things you, you prayed about Bob, but you're making mention of John too. And the Lord's saying, okay, for John too, okay. And Paul is showing us that that counts. Praise God. See, these little insights are helpful. So making mention of you always in my prayers, making request, talking about a request to God, making re request, if by some means, now at last I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. Paul said, look, I want to come to you, and I'm asking God to be able to come, but I, I don't want to go outside of the will of God. I'm on assignment. I have to do what God's asking me to do. But if I can find a way not to violate the will of God and come to you, I want to do it. I want to do it. So it seems there's flexibility in the will of God, and that Paul is saying, if, it, if you could say it like this, I'm negotiating with God that I would be able to insert a trip to you to be a blessing to you within the assignment that the Lord has given me in this season of my life. So verse 11, here's why. Paul says, for I long to see you. That's one reason. And then that I may impart to you some spiritual gift. I want to impart something of the Holy Spirit that would help you. He said, so that you may be established. I have things I want to impart to you through words through teaching, preaching, but also maybe laying out of hands in prayer. I want to impart something spiritual to you so that you may be established. And then he says, that is that I may be encouraged together. It's almost as if Paul said, it's not just for you. This will bless me too, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. Don't you love that? Paul said, I'll get encouraged too and strengthened by being with you. Verse 13, now I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often plan to come to you. This is not the first time I've thought about this. I often planned to come to you, but was hindered until now. Things came up that I needed to attend to. Uh, but was hindered until now that I, may, that I might have some fruit among you also, just as among the other Gentiles. In other words, I, I wanted to come to you many times. I've been trying to come to you. Because I want to sow into you some things that I have learned, things that I've sown in other cities and with other churches and other uh, regions. I want, to, I want to see those same things happen with you. So I've been trying to come to you. Verse 14, I am a debtor both to Greeks and, and to barbarians, both to wise and to unwise. So as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. What is he saying? I am not a racist. I am not prejudiced. I show no partiality. I'm not a respecter of persons. Uh, I'm not overlooking you because I don't think that you're worth my time. Oh, no, I'm a debtor. Oh, the Lord has saved me. I am in debt to Jesus to make sure that every person in the world, regardless of who they are, 
what their culture is, background, doesn't make any difference. He said, I'm a debtor to preach the gospel to everyone, and that includes you who are in Rome. Verse 16, and then we get to these precious words. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. Before I read the complimentary verse in verse 17, let's just break that down for a moment. He said, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. He said, I'm not ashamed to come preach it to you in Rome, even though that's the seat of the nation of Rome, the Roman Empire. That's where the emperor sits, right? He said, I'm, I'm not afraid. You know, there are some smart people there, but I'm not embarrassed. I'm not ashamed to come and preach the gospel of Christ. Why? Because it is the power of God. Notice, he didn't say the gospel conveys the power of God. He didn't say the gospel reveals the power of God, and it does. He didn't say the gospel uh, just outlines the power of God, talks about it. No, he said the gospel is the power of God. Isn't that interesting? The gospel, the message of the gospel, is the power of God unto salvation or to salvation for everyone who believes. Now, why, why is the gospel itself the power of God to salvation? Well, as Paul said to the Corinthians, he said, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached. Well, he wasn't calling preaching the gospel foolish, but it's apparently foolish to the human mind. Like, what's that going to do? It pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. When we preach the gospel, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And that's how people believe and get saved, because we're saved by faith. So this is why Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. Now, why the Jew first? Because God first made promises to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and their descendants. And so God is saying, first, I have to keep my promise to them. I made a promise that I would bless them and bring this salvation to them, and that through them, the entire world would receive it. But if I don't keep my promise to them, then what confidence would anybody else have that I would keep my promise to them as well? Right? So he said to the Jew first. He made the covenant first with the Jews. This Bible came through the Jews. The Messiah, Jesus, came through the Jews. He is Jewish. See, and we just have to recognize that, that it's not us and them. Oh, no. We receive salvation through the Jewish people. And so Paul said, look, to the Jew first. This gospel is for the Jew first, but it's also for the Greek. It's not limited to the Jews. For in it, in the gospel, here's verse 17, in it the righteousness of God is revealed. Oh, this is why it's the power of God. It reveals the righteousness of God. We'll get into this in subsequent chapters. This revelation of righteousness changed my life, and it's part of the gospel. For in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. In other words, it, you don't get it the whole thing at one time, but there are layers to this. And from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. When this gospel is taught and preached, you get faith. And this is how you live. This is how you get saved. And you're born again. Verse 18. For, now he's going to show something on the contrary. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness because what may be known of God is manifest in them for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Now, there's a lot in there that we could take the time to break down, but let me just give you the gist of it. Paul said, listen, the gospel also communicates the wrath of God, and we're going to see it in some, some of these chapters. The wrath of God, that sin is going to be judged. So the good news is that Jesus came to save us from our sins. But the bad news is if you don't receive salvation through Jesus, then the wrath of God against sin is going to come. So he says, the wrath of God is revealed against those who walk in ungodliness and unrighteousness, people who are suppressing the truth. What does that mean? It goes on to say, no, God has shown them in their hearts. 
And he, he also says that these invisible attributes of God are clearly seen. Well, how can something invisible be clearly seen? He said they're clearly seen by the things that God created. The sun, the moon, the stars, the atmosphere, the solar system, the way that everything works with perfect precision and balance and is sustained and uh, the ability to for the earth to sustain complex life and such. The more you look into science, the more it points to an intelligent designer. Don't believe the theory of evolution. These theories are just theories to try to eliminate God from the picture. Science shows amazing precision. Nothing just explodes into being. You, you never see an explosion scene where something, you know, bomb goes off or something and somebody came and said, look, it exploded into a watch. No, never. Nothing. Ex chaos does not cause order. No, order is caused by design. Beautiful order as we have in this world in the creation is caused by design. And so God says they're without excuse. Although they knew God, they didn't glorify him as God. They decided not to give God the credit, not to even to acknowledge him. But they became futile in their thoughts. Now, why did they become futile? It goes on to say they became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. Do you remember the Bible says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. The moment you espouse atheism or potential atheism, Gnosticism, that why well, I don't know if there's a God or not, right? The moment you espouse that and you refuse to acknowledge looking out at science and the world and the universe and such, you refuse to acknowledge, You're, you get darker because the premise of your belief system is on faulty facts. And that's why the Bible says two things. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge and the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. In other words, until you acknowledge that God is creator, then you can't learn anything. You're going to be basing everything you learn on a faulty foundation. So it's all going to be built on something not true. See, and so uh, because they did not accept God, glorify him, nor were thankful, and we should be thankful. He created us. We get an opportunity to live life. See, when you're thankful, now you're thinking straight. But became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. You become darker and darker because without God in the picture, you think it's just us, and then all these. And then, of course, we have Satan and the demonic. So they're influencing us and we don't even realize it. Verse 22, professing to be wise, and many people do, educated, degrees, professors and such, professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man. So here are people that are so eloquent because they're highly educated, very well read, have degrees at the end of their name. And all this eloquence is conveying foolishness. Because it's not true. It's based on faulty facts. But it sounds like it's true. It sounds like they know what they're talking about. God says, but they don't. It's not true. It's dark. And so, and he said, and, and some of these people throughout time have changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and food four-footed animals and creeping things. In other words, they make statues to worship. This happens around the world. And they're bowing down to these statues of things that God created. Instead of worshiping God, they're worshiping something God created. Verse 24, Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. In other words, see, this is what happens is when you don't acknowledge God and serve Him, then you're left to yourself. And you're left to other people's opinions and people begin to drag you down. And so he goes on to say, uh, they, uh, therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness. In other words, you want to live like that? Go ahead, live like that. In the lusts of their hearts, whatever their heart desired. I hear people say, follow your heart. And according to the Bible, do not follow your heart. Why? Because all kind of corrupt things come into our hearts. All kind of thoughts, evil thoughts, wicked thoughts. Uh, lustful thoughts, perverse thoughts come into our hearts. Do not follow your heart. Follow the Lord. Follow his word. See, this is the truth. So uh, they, God gave them over to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie. The truth for the lie. Well, what is the lie? The lie is the refusal to acknowledge the truth that God is creator God and that he created us and that his word is truth and such. 
Everything else is the lie that that's, excuse me, that that's not true. Whether you be atheist or, or agnostic, uh, agnostic or whatever, you believe the lie. And so they worshiped and served the creature rather than, and then, than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Sometimes we worship people and their intelligence and such instead of God. We believe them instead of God. In chapter 3, you'll see that Paul says, let God be true and every man a liar. Any man that contradicts God, we should know, oh, I'm not going to listen to him. It's against God, against his word. Verse 26, for this reason, God gave them, these people, up to vile passions. God said, go ahead. You want to keep going down that road? Go ahead. Vile passions. For even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men, committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. What is God saying? God says, this is what happens when your heart becomes dark. You become vulnerable and susceptible to more perverse, more twisted, more unnatural lusts and desires. And people think, well, that's just the way I am. And God's saying, that's not the way you were created. No, but in this world, and you're hanging around people that open themselves up to these things and say, you know, love is love and any, anything goes. And because there's no God, there's no judgment, there's no right and wrong. We get to all be who we want to be and do what we want to do. And, and Paul says, and God gives them over to that. You want to be like that? Go ahead, be like that. And he said it even gets into homosexuality with women lusting for women and men lusting for uh, men. And so God is saying this is a progression. Of course, there are many people who have fallen into this, but they weren't trying to be rebellious, but they were born into this world and all these ideas come. And let's not forget the demonic realm. Oh, Satan does these things to us. And sometimes we can even say, well, this is just how I am, not realizing that from a little child, the enemy was working things inside of us. And then we hear something here and something there that this is okay and that's okay. And before we know it, we're espousing and embracing things that are not who we created. We were created to be. It's not the way we're designed. It's not natural. It's not our calling. And yet it feels inside like it is. And this is the work of the enemy. This is not what God wants for people. God wants wholeness and fulfillment and blessing and pleasure for people. But that all happens within the will of God. Verse 28, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. This is people that get to this point. They, they don't want to think about God. They don't like people bringing it up. You see people going to court to try to litigate, to remove the Ten Commandments off the county steps or whatever. Why? Because it makes me feel bad. I don't want to see that. They're not going to say that. They're just going to talk about, you know, religious liberties and freedom. But the bottom line is they don't want to hear about God. They don't want to see anything about God. Why? It reminds me of something that I don't want to know. I'm suppressing this. See, and so even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind. What does that mean? They don't even feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit anymore. A debased mind to do those things which are not fitting being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whispers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud. Boy, I tell you what, we're seeing these things in our day and age right here in the United States of America, aren't we? Boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents. Oh man, that's on the list too? You better believe it is disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful. Oh, we, we've just watched people. I mean, just abuse people, hit people. And, and there's no reason the person's not attacking you and you just abuse them and hurt them. Unforgiving, unmerciful. Watch this. Who knowing the righteous judgment of God down inside, they know this is punishable who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. Boy, that's talking about voting. <laughs> that's talking about voting. That's talking about condoning. That's talking about speaking things to say it's okay or not saying anything when something's not okay that they're actually approving. And there are a whole lot of people that may not be actually doing these acts, but they're approving these acts. 
and voting for these acts. Well, I tell you what, I don't want to be in that category. I want to be standing on the right side with God by the grace of Jesus, the blood of Jesus cleansing me from my sin and me now standing for righteousness. I tell you what, I think about a lady who may have had an abortion because a lot of ladies have had abortions. But did you know the blood of Jesus cleanses you from your sin? And he washes you. We confess these things. We've all sinned. And it's going to say that in the third chapter. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We confess and the Lord forgives us. But from that point, we stand for righteousness. We don't keep standing for something because we got caught up in it. No. we. By the way, those babies are in heaven with God. And so we don't need to worry about them. God's got that part taken care of too. But the Lord washes us from our sins. But now, having been saved, we stand for righteousness. See, this is what God wants for us. This is who we are. We do not want to be in this other category. Well, that was a lengthy first chapter, but I tell you what, it's a powerful chapter. And it just gives a precursor to the doctrines, the clarity that we're receiving from this precious book called Romans. I'll see you tomorrow for chapter two.